Hi, and welcome back to uh, part two uh, of the lecture for uh, A Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, we did one through six, uh, scenes one through six last time around. We'll do scenes uh, seven through 11 this time around. Uh, just like before, I've prepared some uh, pretty extensive uh, lecture notes here so I can just really read from this and, and refer to uh, the text uh, when needed here. So we're getting right into it. We're coming off of uh, scene six, and that's the scene where it ends with a pretty touching moment between um, Blanche and Mitch. Uh, and it almost does seem like he's providing her with such a, a, an important gentleness that it's, it's redeeming her in some sense. This is all reinforced by the beginning of scene seven, uh, or at least I guess you could say validated uh, by the evidence of her washing her clothes, or in other words, washing her sins uh, away. Um, if we get a little bit more concrete uh, as far as what her sins are, uh, to be uh, brief, uh, you're probably talking about um, an emphasis on materialism, uh, she does seem to harbor some prejudices. Uh, she definitely seems to harbor some classist uh, ideas uh, and a kind of resentment of the lower class and, and feeling like she's superior uh, over uh, common folk uh, like Stanley and others that uh, he is surrounded by, uh, maybe even Stella because she's married down into uh, this kind of common hood. Um, and the beauty, uh, not, you know, we talked about the materialism, but also it's to her own physical beauty, uh, which is maybe why she's so obsessed with youth, uh, as that's something that, uh, as you get older and older, you can never retrieve, right? And there could be some, uh, resentment there that she has, uh, and she puts a little bit too much, uh, importance on it. Um, so it's also her birthday, ironically, you know, we like to think of a birthday as being kind of a, a potential new beginning, uh, for a person, right? depending on their needs. Stanley calls her Her Majesty, uh, reminding her uh, and us as readers uh, of, of, of her being a part of the wealthy class, uh, who uh, you could argue are aligned with the sins of lust, materialism, and desire. However, Stanley also refers to her as a canary, uh, which of course is a bird. And if you look up the symbolism of canary, uh, and you just look a little bit on Google and, and you know, check out a couple sites. Uh, one thing you find for Canary is healing energy. So that's reinforcing this idea that, that Blanche has been healed uh, in some regard. Uh, and it helps to heal wounds from the past. Uh, and of course, there's all kinds of wounds that maybe, uh, I'm sorry, Blanche is, is trying to heal from, all right? On page 120, she sings a song that pronounces her need to move past uh, pretense, deception, and falsehood, uh, while at the same time, Stanley yearns to expose her past and torment her. Um, it's really nice when an author uh, can create this juxtaposition, uh, can, can, can create these kinds of uh, parallel threads uh, that occur, uh, of course, at the same time. And what I mean by that, at least within what we have here, is here she is singing this song, which is all about just believe in me, no matter what, no matter what I say, no matter what I've done, just believe in me. And Mitch is probably that person uh, who who does believe in her, right? We'll see if that holds up as we move uh, as we move forward. Um, and, and then, of course, we have Stanley who is trying to expose her, who is finding out the dirt on her, her, her secrets that she keeps hidden. And he's finding this out through kind of word of mouth and people who seem to know some things about Blanche. And now he's revealing that to Stella and we're getting a very different understanding of Blanche all the while. So you see two different things happening. Uh, here uh, in this scene. It's pretty, it's pretty well done as far as craftsmanship uh, goes for the author, for Tennessee Williams. Um, I feel as if she wants someone, maybe even God. Remember, Mitch has a very kind of close uh, symbolism uh, to God. It's the whole idea of uh, the Archangel Michael and Saint Michael and all that stuff, which is who is greater than God? Nobody is greater than God. It's a rhetorical question. So she's looking for someone to believe in her, maybe even God, as she is in need of a transformation. Uh, we find out that once the Bella Reeve estate, which of course is a beautiful dream, uh, 
once that's gone, uh, it's replaced by her living in the Hotel Flamingo. So you can think of a flamingo and it does seem kind of pomp and there could be some pretense there and it's extravagant looking uh, kind of animal. But maybe that's the pretense and the deception that she's built her identity off of. So we've, re we've replaced Bella Reeve with flamingo, right? We've replaced the idea of a beautiful dream with an unmanaged desire, reality, and the pretense and the deception that she uses in order to cover up for her reality, right? Um, okay, very good. She's just looking for someone to believe in her so that the world is not make-believe any longer. Page 121. We learn she is uh, quite promiscuous despite uh, this false air that she puts on of being a very respectable and chaste lady. Uh, but now we really start to find out the real information of her promiscuity. Um, the icing on the cake, so to speak, uh, is that she got mixed up with a 17-year-old boy, uh, a student of hers. I believe this is the reason why she got kicked out of her teacher position. She got fired and was told never to return uh, because she did have an affair with a younger boy. Um, I think one of the questions uh, on, that you had for a discussion question was why do you think she feels the need to be with young men? Uh, what is that doing for her? And of course, I look forward uh, to seeing your responses. Um, this seems to make sense when you think about what she was trying to do with that young man who was selling the uh, newspaper, the Evening Star, right? So we're seeing this. Uh, this need or this yearning to be with young men and we have to ask ourselves why uh, why would she have this desire what does this say about Blanche pages 123 through 124 there's an exchange between Blanche and Stanley um, basically she's in there singing this song uh, kind of occupying that bathroom and he just has to pee uh, very badly. Uh, and, and, and in fact, I think he says something, uh, you know, my kidneys, uh, my kidneys need, you know, uh, need to be in that bathroom. And I think if you analyze this based on some of the uh, more important themes that uh, are a part of uh, this text, there's this contrast between paying attention to and being patient with the soul, something that is essentially uh, unmaterial, uh, that is completely psychological and uh, obviously, um, and there's you know this contrast, is that what we need to put a lot of time and effort into, is, is dealing with the soul or spirituality, or in other words, the psychology of the individual, or, if we're just concerned with the kidneys here, is the whole idea that we're, we're really just concerned with the, the body and the senses and the desires of the body, right? And these kinds of instinctual, uh, the instinctual reality of, uh, of the human dilemma, which is just the body here. I think once we get past six, uh, and that's interesting too, right? Because we were talking about, um, as far as biblical kind of symbolism, uh, six is the day of the creation of man and woman. By default, of course, comes the imperfections of man and women. And now we have to kind of atone for this or, 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 or try to remedy it. Day seven is the rest. We've talked about that, but it's even interesting that probably the most important transition for Blanche, which is probably our key prominent protagonist of this entire piece, it occurs right in scene six, the end of scene six, the imperfections of man, and then we go into scene seven where she seems to be, a, 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 I wouldn't say a completely different person because she'll have these kinds of moments of reverting to her former self at times, but she is completely trying to gain forgiveness for her prior sins, uh, the sinful kind of nature of the character who she once was, and this is all occurring now in scene seven. So I think, I would imagine if, if that is a prominent theme that was probably purposeful as far as Tennessee Williams is concerned for this major transition for Blanche to occur in between six and seven, knowing we're going from the imperfections of man uh, by default, just, just man and women, period, uh, into rest, right? Into this kind of final rest. Uh, so I think that's bringing uh, that idea to mind. Notice that the whole idea of kind of paying attention to the soul is that you are able to, if the more and more you reinforce 
your your you know uh, maturity of the soul or, or your your understanding of the soul that allows you to control the desires uh, of the body right so as one goes up the other kind of goes down here right um, the sin that Blanche must atone for is probably making a god so we're talking about the sin of idolatry of the boy and his poetry. Maybe that's it. I say that with a big question mark because I think, you know, what are the sins that Blanche is trying to atone for or that she is atoning for? What are they? And I think that's a pretty wide open uh, question and there could be many different responses. Uh, and you will be writing a paper on this, so that's something maybe you want to be thinking about, right? What are the sins she's trying to atone for? For me, I seem to wrap a lot of this up with idolatry and the fact that she was worshiping false idols, things of that, things of that nature on a very general level. Um, that boy was extremely good looking, right? Um, when we talk about, uh, this is Alan that she's mentioning here. Uh, Stella even says, as far as Blanche is concerned, she says that Blanche worshiped, and that's a very direct diction. It's a purposeful word being used here. Worshipped the ground that he walked on. All right. Um, this could also uh, connect to uh, the first short story of the semester, which was uh, Monroe's To Reach Japan. Um, she worships the boy. She worships his handsomeness. She worships the poetry that he put together. Um, this is all very Hellenistic uh, in, in, in content, right? So poetry is a distraction from our authentic spiritual lives because it is essentially a craze and an addiction of sorts. Um, an addiction to ourselves in at least a few respects, right? If I'm addicted to poetry, writing poetry, right? Uh, the act of writing poetry, maybe it's because I'm addicted to myself in many different respects. Um, and it's more of uh, egotism uh, and vanity, right? Now, I think this is where... Um, on these pages, 123, 124, this is where another very interesting theme, uh, kind of related to concepts of, uh, I, I would imagine, religion on, on one level comes into play. We have two competing senses of masculinity. Um, and I, I don't want to say too much about the trap uh, that Blanche feels that she's caught in. Uh, and that was one of your discussion questions to see what trap you think that is. How do you articulate the trap that she is caught in? But here's my understanding of the trap, for the most part, and this is what it kind of centers around. We're given a Greek version of masculinity versus a Western Christian sense uh, of masculinity. And I think we have two characters in this, uh, in this play that represent these two different versions of masculinity. On one hand, you have Alan, who is uh, the poetic uh, who is the refined, who is probably more important than those characteristics, the sensitive, uh, the uh, compassionate, right? And that, of course, contrasts heavily with Stanley, who is probably more of the Western Christian sense um, uh, of masculinity, uh, which is kind of, um, you know, rough, uh, and crude, uh, but not poetic and sensitive, right? That's maybe more reserved for the Greek sense. And we have two different types of men, uh, the, 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 the complete opposite, uh, uh, at the complete opposite uh, ends of, those spec of the spectrum. Uh, you have uh, Alan and Stanley. And which is the type of man that is allowed to exist with convenience and with let's say, approval in this world? Is it the masculine man or is it the sensitive, maybe even bordering on effeminate man? And I think there's an obvious answer to that question, right? It's the masculine man uh, that essentially gains approval within our society and maybe for uh, all kinds of reasons. These are important, this is an important theme to preview and be aware of as we move into the Capote short stories uh, that you'll be reading, uh, especially Shut a Final Door, uh, which I'll probably be discussing this theme a little bit more and there'll be questions surrounding this theme uh, as more as well. In page, on page 125, she gently withdraws from Stanley's gentle touch. This is Stella I'm talking about. So those words are used yet again. Uh, like I said, it's probably one of the biggest motifs in the text is, the, is this gentleness. And here she moves away uh, from the gentleness of Stanley, uh, who maybe is using it 
at least in the moment, and maybe this is a rejection, right? This is a rejection of him. Um, the union, on page 125, uh, there's the union of Mitch and Stanley, figuratively. Stanley accepts it. Uh, and this is an affirmation of God's power, when you think about the symbolism involved here, the rhetoric used to teach insist upon it. Stanley feels he must warn Mitch. His conscience depends on it. Stella even says, you told Mitch about all these things you've been hearing about Blanche, and he says, yeah, I owe it to him. And Stanley says, my conscience, my sense of right and wrong depends on it. And I guess one of the questions, I don't think this was a discussion question, but it's a, it's a good question. Is Stanley being authentic, right? Did he tell Mitch just because he hates Blanche uh, and he'll do anything uh, within his means to kind of tear her down uh, and uh, bring her down? Or uh, is he really telling Mitch because he cares for Mitch and, and, and there's a sense of kind of right and wrong that he just can't get around here, right? Mitch is such a good human being that I gotta offer him the truth about Blanche. He deserves it. Let's, uh, here's some uh, last points. Um, I think, you know, if you're, if you're reading with a lot of symbolism intact here, we don't want God or God's people, hence Mitch, to give up on Blanche, right? Uh, maybe that's one perspective you could have here. We want somebody to give Blanche a chance, a second chance to stand by her side, right? Some of the questions, I'll just gloss over them, but these were some of the questions that you had. Uh, at this point, is Blanche deserving of your sympathy, especially as we're finding out more secrets uh, about her? Uh, what is more important, the physical well-being or the psychological well-being? Uh, Open-ended questions here. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. At the very end, Stella says, what on earth will she do? Uh, another kind of um, uh, symbol I have in mind here is the apartment that they're all residing in uh, as Blanche comes to stay with Stella and uh, Stanley and they're surrounded by some of their friends and other you know, nearby apartments. I think this whole apartment is basically a, a that's the microcosm and the, the, what it represents is the macrocosm of, of kind of Earth itself, right? Where humanity uh, resides and Blanche verifies this I think over and over by saying I want to leave this place I want to leave this place and it's hard not to get the sense that she's not just saying I want to leave this apartment that's dealing with it on a literal level she wants to leave earth and she wants to leave earth a a kind of purified uh and 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 person who has gained forgiveness and atoned for her sins isn't that the way if you are a religious person that's the way you want to leave earth right and I think that's the way Blanche is looking at this. It's not just leaving the apartment, it's leaving Earth altogether, right? All right, very good. And at the very, very end, Stella doubts, she, she doubts Blanche's feeling of being rested and therefore doubts her brand new outlook on life, right? Scene eight, right at the beginning. Uh, there's some interesting stage direction here. Like I said, it borders on the poetic uh, a lot of the time. Tennessee Williams, is a, it's a beautiful play. Uh, I'm so glad I, I'm teaching this because I, I plan on teaching this a lot because uh, I think it's wonderfully done. So right in the beginning, there's a f the, the, the sun is at an angle uh, in the sky where it's kind of shedding this light like fire and the word fire is used uh, on the business district. Uh, and I think we're, when we talk about business, you can think about some of the other motifs that we've, we've, we've come across uh, so far, uh, especially in regards to the poker playing. Um, so when you think about business, arguably there's a lot of greed, materialism, and even the uh, kind of prospect of gambling involved. Uh, you talk to a lot of uh, business people, especially when you start talking about you know, Wall Street speculations and stuff like that. It's all a big gamble. They're gambling with people's money. They're gambling with, you know, uh, and taking all kinds of risks. So I think it's if, if the fire is there, we're talking about hellfire. Uh, we're talking about something that is kind of in disapproval uh, of God. And there's another motif to be on the lookout throughout the entire play, not just the last few scenes that we're covering here in this lecture, is heat and hot 
and fire and all of these things that kind of take us into a hellish perspective on humanity uh, and the sins and vices of humanity as well. Um, there's no Mitch in the beginning of this scene, which means there's no God. Just the artist's artificial smile of Blanche. Uh, this is the first time she, she claims to be stood up. She's honest about it. She, you know, he's, he stood me up. But the first time she has actually tried to be with a pious, godly representation, right? So yeah, this might be the first time she's being stood up, but it's the first time that she's encountered and tried to have a relationship with somebody like Mitch. I don't think she really takes a, tries to be with somebody like Mitch who is so devoted uh, and cut from uh, such a certain cloth. So yeah, she will be stood up. We also know that he's received information from Stanley and he's found out more about her past and there's obviously some disapproval on his behalf. On page 130, Stanley is likened to a cursing parrot. Um, and I think the analysis here, uh, obviously we know the way symbolism works is you just draw upon what you know externally about the symbol that's being used. So what do parrots do? They repeat. Uh, they essentially just repeat and kind of imitate behavior uh, and speech. And I think that's what this is all about. Stanley is the, he's someone who merely imitates vulgar behavior and lacks a genuine personality and character. And, you know, that, that could be a broader question. How many men that you know or young men that you know um, act the way they act simply because they are mimicking or imitating behavior and kind of personality traits and, and any certain kind of attitude that they are just copying from somewhere else, right? How authentic are these young men or these men that we know, how, myself included, right? Or am I just copying all kinds of representations that have come before me and I'm just kind of continuing this kind of, you know, conforming to this ideal of what a man is. Um, maybe that's what we're, that maybe that's what's being mentioned here on an analytical level about Stanley. Uh, Stanley, uh, it says, spears his fork, he's eating here. And uh, it sounds very violent and assertive. Also, uh, he has no reaction uh, to a joke that's been told. Uh, I don't need to, to repeat the joke here, but it, uh, it involves uh, a parrot and a preacher. And the bottom line is the parrot is not reserved when the preacher walks into the room and he curses and he swears and he takes he has no regard for the priest meaning uh, or the preacher he has no regard for religious sentimentality and religious kind of i guess you could say principles uh and the respect that surrounds it well that sounds a little bit like stanley perhaps right and if that's the case if if i'm looking into this in an accurate way then he is opposed to the kind of religiousness that Blanche is trying to get in touch with, right? Maybe he's opposed to that, and that Mitch represents. We've already talked about Stanley and Mitch being major contrast, uh, there being a major contrast between these two men uh, throughout the text. So he has no reaction to the joke because he is the vulgar imitator who is not abashed by religious understanding. Page 131, Stanley, this is interesting. I even starred this because this is where we get a kind of a, a, a sense of Stanley that comes out of nowhere. Um, Stanley reacts. He stands up for himself against what he calls the pair of queens because S Blanche and Stella have kind of linked arms, so to speak, in this scene. And both of them have kind of reverted to that high and mighty uh, sense of themselves that obviously comes from being a part of what, what it seems like is some aristocratic family name uh, of, the, of, of the South uh, and feeling superior in, in many different respects. And they seem to link up here and, and they're mocking Stanley for being this common vulgar uh, man that he is. And when I put it that way, you might ask yourself, well, do we have sympathy for Stanley? I mean, he, he's, you know, we've, 
he's guilty of domestic violence. He's a drinker. Uh, he he uh, he's a buffoon, perhaps. But here, because he is the butt end of their jokes and their ridicule, and they're targeting him in such a way, well, is it time to have some sympathy for Stanley? He he retorts. But every man, no matter how common, is a king amongst women, and that's the implication. He's like, you got, you, he says, you know, you guys can make fun of me, have, have your laughs, do what you want to do, but guess what? And he's almost reminding these women and trying to put them in their place from a patriarchal point of view. He says, every man, it doesn't matter how vulgar, how common, how stupid, how unattractive, etc., etc., etc. Every man is a king amongst women, and I think. He's obviously reinforcing that sense of patriot um, patriarchy uh, here, uh, and I'll leave it up to you what, what what to think about that. Right? I was just talking about sympathy for him. Well, depending on your perspective, does that sympathy hold up? And I, you know, that's one of the questions. And we got to remember we come from all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, we listen to all kinds of media out there and all kinds of different points of view. And so this was one of the questions on the discussion questions, but it's a serious question. Do you agree that every man is a king in regards to how Stanley is using in, his con in, in this context? Do you believe that a man, no matter what, is king amongst women? Yes, no, and what are your reasons uh, why? Right? So it's, kind of a, uh, it's very much an opinion-based uh, question. Page 133. Uh, I, I guess another question just to quickly add to that would be, what do you think is the author's point of view on a question like that? Here the author is writing Stanley in as a character who is reinforcing and kind of stating uh, adamantly this sense of patriarchy, right? This position on patriarchy. And what do you think is the author's point of view? That might take a little bit of background information, looking up a little bit more about Tennessee Williams, which I have not done. But that's always, that's what we really want to know, I think. It's probably the most important thing. What does the author have in mind? Can we figure it out? Page 133. Stanley reminds Stella that once Blanche goes away, uh, they can get back to the good aspect of their relationship. And he states what that good aspect of the relationship is. Unbridled and creative and loud and unabashed sex. So get Blanche out of here. We'll get back to what this relationship is all about, which is giving into our instinctual animal nature and have really powerful sex, I guess you could say, right? This contrasts with the candles on the white cake. Uh, probably in the sense that the white cake is purity, right? And, and maybe even a certain chastity as well. <laughs> On page 134, some more interesting content for, for Stanley. He stands up for political correctness, he says. And here, uh, you know, it's hard not to have sympathy for him because he's standing up against kind of discrimination of Polish people. Uh, he basically says, I'm not a Polak, which, as I mentioned, uh, I think in the discussion questions or, or earlier, probably in the last lecture. Uh, Polak is a discriminatory term uh, used against Polish people. Poles, P-O-L-E-S, is, is, is politically correct. So he corrects them. Uh, and then he also has this, he claims this fierce nationalism, which might make sense on, on, on a couple, for a couple of different reasons. One, he was in the military. I think anybody you come across who spent time in the military, whether it's the Army, Navy, uh, or uh, the Marines, or, or really any other branch of the military, will probably have a strong sense of nationalism because they've essentially committed themselves to this country. Uh, so it's just there. Another is that, remember that America is supposed to be the land where we have forsaken kings and queens. Uh, we don't have kings and queens. We have a president, right? A democratically elected president, of course. You could get super critical of that notion and realize that elections are all fraudulent uh, and kind of set up, but that's perhaps a, an entirely different lecture, and I don't want to get into that right now. But the idea is we have, we have pushed out this European concept and kind of political framework of kings and queens. And maybe that's another reason Stanley, as kind of just a common individual who comes from meager background, a meager background, uh, in, in an immigrant background nonetheless, uh, it doesn't mention if he's first generation, second generation, we don't get that background. But 
it would make sense that he would have the strong nationalism because I want to support and believe in a country that has essentially tried to level the playing ground for people coming from more or less common backgrounds, right? So maybe that's another reason, and a respectable reason at that. You know, I kind of get on board with that idea. I think that sounds pretty cool if that's where he's coming from. So in scene eight, if you're doing some more or less detailed uh, kind of character analysis of Stanley and you're trying to be consistent and you're trying to get a full kind of uh, expose and a full kind of composition of his character, I think this is stuff that you have to look into and you have to take into account on some level, right? Because it's really kind of creating a full character sketch um, and bringing in some stuff that maybe we weren't expecting. Uh, very good. On page 125, Blanche lies about her age. She says that she's 27. Uh, and there probably is some biblical stuff taking place with the number 27, but nothing that I can really sink my teeth into too much. This is what happens at the end of this chapter. He gives her, he's like, I got a surprise for you, Blanche. And he gives her a ticket to leave, a ticket to return back to Laurel. Now we know that she's lost her job there. Um, her reputation is essentially in tatters. The Bella Riva estate is no more. Um, the family is no more. What the heck can she return to? I think we start to feel some of her desperation here, right? She And she has a physical reaction. This is amazing, so well written. She has a physical reaction to not just the ticket, of course, but the idea of the ticket. And it's probably because, you could probably put it better than I can because it would take a paragraph to do it. But it's probably because she's realizing that she has nothing to go back to. And notice that I'm being completely vague right now. It would take a minute, to, a minute or several minutes at least uh, to go into the kind of detail needed uh, to answer that question, right? Why is she having a physical reaction to this ticket? Okay, very good. Closing notes for this chapter. Stella sticks up for Blanche. Says it was, uh, says, it w says it was people like Stanley. Not Stanley per se, but people like Stanley. People of similar attitudes. Men, most likely, is what she's talking about here. Men with similar attitudes and similar kind of belief systems. It was men like Stanley who have abused her and forced her to change and become the kind of person that she is. So Stella essentially blames what Blanche has become on Stanley or, or people like Stanley. Stanley dones or, or wears his wonderful silk bowling shirt. He, he, it's hard not to get a feeling of like that he's like royalty when he puts this shirt on. And of course, he's getting ready to go and bowl and compete. You know, there's another uh, evidence of, of this idea of competition. And it, when he puts on this silk bowling shirt, it obviously doesn't seem to fit his common character, right? Uh, doesn't seem to really match up with who he normally is. Next up, Stanley claims that Stella wanted uh, to be with him because he was common. That's an interesting idea. You know, he says to Stella, you know, the reason you liked me in the first place was because I took you away from all that Bella Reeve crap. I took you away from all that nonsense uh, and, and that that high society that you were just fed up with and you wanted somebody like me. You wanted somebody crass. You wanted somebody who was just kind of bold and assertive, uh, yet common. This is what you wanted all along. And maybe he's right. And Stella is given this kind of obscure, private, yet meaningful awareness uh, after he says these words. Page 112, I'll just read. That's, that's page 112 in my book. Uh, this is uh, a smaller book. Basically, what he's saying to her is that he saved her uh, from her previous life uh, he pulled her down off the columns, meaning I saved you from that cozy, boring, unerotic life uh, of kind of privilege, right? And now you have me. And I guess it, it is, it's, it's, it's an open-ended question. 
is Stella being with Stanley for the best or for the worst? Did he save her uh, or did he actually kind of pull her away from something uh, that was better for her? Not an easy question to answer. All right, so uh, moving into scene nine here. It starts with uh, Blanche admitting that she is happy to see Mitch. Mitch has paid her a visit. Even he has had a few drinks before this visit, which if you've been following Mitch's character, seems quite uncharacteristic for him. On page 140, it's through stage directions that Blanche is out of reality a bit as she plays Alan's suicide over in her mind. So when we're in scene nine here, we're starting to get some evidence that she's starting to lose her mind, that she's kind of living elsewhere, uh, that her mind is completely preoccupied with the past and she's not necessarily in the, the present, right? She's not totally with it. And this was probably the first evidence. Uh, on page 143, there's a contrast of light and dark, which could be good and evil, right? On page 144, uh, you know, when we talk about, you'll find different interpretations, I'll be very brief. When you talk about why light is good and why dark is evil, it, it really goes back to ancient civilizations and ancient populations where it's light out right now. Why is light good? Because I can see. Uh, I can see around me. Uh, I can see predators. Uh, I can see where I'm going. I can actually live, right? And remember with ancient populations, they didn't have artificial light. They didn't have electricity. They couldn't keep the lights on uh, until four in the morning, right? Uh, doing whatever it is they wanted to do. Uh, so nighttime meant uh, it was evil in the sense that the, it was confusion. Uh, it was a lack of safety. Uh, that's when you had to fear for your life because there could be predators out there, whether it be human beings or animals, right? When you go back way into ancient populations. Um, you'll find other interpretations, but that's really why we, you know, probably we have this kind of dichotomy between light and dark and good and evil, right? Why they're essentially equated. Uh, so page 144. Mitch remains, oh, I'm sorry, removes the paper lantern and it's just the light unabated. Remember that that paper lantern, right? There's a light bulb and then you put the paper lantern over it and essentially it diffuses, or I guess the word might be blanches, uh, the light. So it's obviously a metaphor for Blanche. Blanche is this light perhaps, but she's been putting things over it to essentially diffuse that light or to cover, cover things up, right? And now Mitch which is powerful because of what he symbolizes, which in many respects is kind of religion and forgiveness and honesty and, and, and opening up and truthfulness. He comes in and what does he do? He removes the paper lantern, right? Uh, which essentially means now it is Blanche unabated. It is Blanche completely open at this point. It, cor it correlates with Blanche being herself losing the false sense of herself. Remember the song she was singing uh, in a few scenes, right? Um, you know, just accept me for me, you know, all pretense and all uh, uh, deception aside, just accept me for me. Wouldn't that be nice? Moving on. Um, this could be that, you know, you go into more themes such as realism versus romanticism, or in other words, idealism. Realism is just accept me for who I am. This is it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Whereas romanticism or idealism is um, I want to be the best version of myself and perhaps even if I have to put on false airs and, and, and lie to people, right, and cover things up and keep things to myself, I'm still trying to be that best version of myself. I think what we have here is that paper lantern comes off the light. This is realism. One of the questions you have, um, which you didn't, uh, one of the questions I, I, I can present to you, you didn't have discussion questions for this, uh, these scenes. What about her life? We're talking about Blanche. What about her life, her feelings, hopes, fears, etc.? Has she not been honest about up to this point? And maybe being idealistic, maybe, though this is questionable, maybe being idealistic is likened to a sin. On page 145, he crosses when he's like kind of moving the room, which just makes me think of like the cross in Christianity, right? Could be an allusion to religion. There's also a reference to Kefauver, which sounds very German. And if you look up the meaning of the name, like I said, look these things up. 
if you're lucky, they'll clue you into the ideas that pertain to the context that we have in, uh, in front of us. And the name Kefauver uh, it means extremes in fortune, health, and spirituality. Remember that Blanche is essentially living in between two extremes. I think that's where her major conflict comes from, realism and idealism. She wants to act like her life is nothing but uh, fortuitous, uh, that it, there's happiness there, that there's real contentment and satisfaction. I'm going to go, you know, take a cruise around the world with this guy. Uh, and yet we do know that her life is in, in reality, it's, it's kind of in shambles. So there's the two extremes. And of course, she's caught in the middle. And it's, it's not, I think the conflict, the conflict for Blanche is honesty, right? Um, idealism essentially is dishonesty, whereas, you know, reality is, is, is being honest with herself at this point. That's another question here. How is Blanche caught between these two extremes? I kind of give you, I gave you one uh, understanding of that. Uh, on page 146, Shaw, this is the man she wants to travel around the world with I, in, in a very idealistic way, right? I'm going to travel around the world with this guy, Shaw. Shaw translates the name of the mean, uh, the meaning of the name is God is gracious and gift from God. So maybe she wants to travel around the world with God. Notice how that works. On a literal level, this guy Shaw is going to take her away on a nice boat. And, 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 and give her some escape from this apartment with Stanley and Stella and all these things that she's dreading at this point. On a figurative level, God's going to take her away. Right? Page 146, there's a confession of sorts. Stella uh, Blanche says, I didn't lie in my heart. That's interesting. Use that next time you lie to somebody and you're trying to find a way to get out of it, right? Yeah, I lied to your face. I lied up and down, through my teeth, left and right, all around. I lied, I lied, I lied. However, I didn't lie in my heart. I'm being a bit facetious about it, but I guess it's an interesting debate. It's an interesting question. If I don't lie in my heart, does that make all the difference in the world? Who cares if I lie to your face and I deceive you? I never lied, I guess, in my heart, which means I never lied to myself. And that's all that matters. Interesting, right? I'll let you be the judge of that. Um, and she thanked God for Mitch's gentleness. Right? She's, she, and it seems quite authentic here, right? She's really grateful uh, for the gentleness that Mitch has brought into her life. And I think she's quite happy to see him because uh, she wasn't expecting him probably. Page 147. Um, there's some interesting play upon flowers, flowers for the dead. You get some, some Espanol here, some Spanish, uh, from this Mexican woman who's sell, selling flowers uh, up and down uh, the street. At first, it's flowers for the dead. Blanche respo responds, not now, meaning she's not ready to die, right? Maybe she's not ready to die. Then, then the uh, Mexican woman selling these flowers uh, says, crowns for the dead crowns for the dead so it goes from flowers to crowns and crowns of course is is this you know aspect of of royalty but not in the materialistic or kind of you know political sense but maybe in the religious sense right god as uh, lord uh christ as lord that kind of a crown on page 148 um this this gets kind of strange probably because it's so uh, ambiguous and we don't get a lot of detail but there's a mention of blood-stained pillow slips um, and I'm just gonna like be very open about how I interpret this so you know uh, it might sound obviously strange blood-stained blood-stained pillow slips we're all left to make our own assumptions as to what this could be but, I mean, I'm thinking it pro I don't know. I mean, does it have something to do with a woman's period? Does it have something to do with sex and, and, and something physical? I'm not sure. And, and not much is said. It's almost like Blanche is just saying it because she needs to say it. It's a confession of sorts. 
the way I took it is, it's something relating to of the body and of the flesh, and maybe even the beginnings of an earthly desire for a woman, a young woman, right? And it became a desire that was unmanageable or impossible to control at some point. Hence the need for forgiveness. Hence the need for some kind of um, uh, 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 atoning uh, for, for these sins or an absolving of these sins. I might be wrong. I look forward to seeing what your interpretations are. This also is that kind of evidence where it's hard to make sense of because we're not given a lot of detail. But if you're looking for an accurate understanding, interpretation, analysis of Blanche and what's really a part of her major conflicts here, this is the kind of stuff you got to try to make sense of, right? Especially because it's coming out in such an open and, 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 and kind of vulnerable time for her, right? So try not to avoid it if you can. Uh, page 149, uh, this notion of death versus desire. If you uh, are under the guidelines and lunacy drives you out of your mind desire, of, of desire, then you are afraid of death and therefore you want to avoid, avoid it. I guess that makes sense. If your whole life is centered around desire and kind of consumption and indulgence, then of course you're going to be afraid of death because that's the complete end of desire and any opportunity of indulgence, right? So of course you're going to want to avoid death. All right, beginning of scene 10. It does seem like, like she's reverted um, a bit. She's reverted. And I think this is coming off of Mitch telling Blanche that he can't be with her. He wouldn't know what to say to his mother. She's, she's too tainted. She's too impure. And I think there's a lot of sympathy here for Blanche. Here we have a woman who, at least on a symbolic figurative level, is trying to atone for her sins. A lot of it has to do with the initial gentleness and outreach of Mitch. And now Mitch, based on what he's heard from Stanley, is saying, I can't be with you. And it kind of hits us like a ton of bricks. It hits Blanche like a, a dozen tons of bricks, right? And now it's like, so what's the point, right? Maybe that's why we have this reversion here. She's wearing a rhinestone tiara, which we understand is a diamond substitute. So it's falseness, it's pretense, it's deception. Lying to herself, lying to other people, right? Her clothes are soiled, crumpled, and scoffed. And the word that really sticks out there for me is soiled, right? Meaning the soul is soiled, right? Based on corruptions. Um, her, her dress is green and white striped, which was basically the same as Stanley's bowling shirt. Green is envy, right? Which is essentially desire and indulgence, right? Perhaps white is purity. So maybe if you're looking at this, uh, these, these, you know, this, this dress on a level of colors and symbolism, uh, then what you have here is she's right in the middle, right? Between purity and indulgence, right? She's on page 155, uh, Stanley de uh, declares uh, that it's a red letter night. Uh, and I had to look up the meaning of this, but it means that it's just kind of an extra special occasion, right? Uh, and it's, it's different for each of these two characters. Uh, for Stanley, it's a red letter night because they are expecting the baby, right? They're expecting this baby boy uh, into their lives. And for Blanche, it's a red letter night because she's expecting this trip and to be saved by this millionaire Shaw who is going to basically save her uh, and take her away. Um, so I guess the question would be, how do we analyze these two very different occasions? Uh, are, do they represent the extreme uh, kind of, are they the extreme opposites of one another, right? The birth of a baby versus uh, the kind of trip that she's going to be taking with this Shaw uh, character. Uh, are they actually uh, incredibly similar upon some kind of analysis and they represent the very kind of same idea? Uh, on page 155, uh, he is also uh, donning uh, his silk pajamas uh, that he wore on his wedding night, which is very strange uh, that Stanley would, would feel the need uh, as he's kind of spending some time with Blanche on her final night and before the birth of his child uh, to wear these silk pajamas. Uh, it, for me, there seems to be a sense of prowess and virility with these pajamas uh, because obviously it represents kind of the nighttime and perhaps uh, some of the sexual uh, kind of sense of things that comes with the nighttime as well.
on page 155 also um, Stanley expects and wants a son uh, and I think this makes sense uh, very simply uh, because there is a gender preference due to that gender dominance um, you know it's hard not to talk to you I have a lot of friends with children and you know it's it's very common to come across uh, a father uh, or, or a father-to-be and there is this um, preference of a boy and you might ask yourself well why you know why would there be a preference of a boy it could be it could be because boys have and men have dominance within our patriarchal societies and therefore that's why there's this preference for uh, that child to be a son right um, okay she seems Blanche seems to be using her upper class uh, superiority, at least what she had, as a defense mechanism here. Uh, but she has surrendered the importance of physical beauty for spiritual growth. So, uh, you know, prior to perhaps this scene or or, or you know scene nine or or even eight, uh, she had used physical beauty as leverage uh, 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 as leverage over other characters. At this point, all of that has been surrendered because I think she's kind of accept her aging uh, nature, the fact that her beauty has diminished. Now it's maybe maybe an emphasis, though not really spoken, of course, not stated directly of spiritual growth. On page 158, uh, Stanley, 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 he bursts her little bubble and he says to her, quote, there isn't a goddamn thing but imagination and he's talking about what Stella, uh, what Blanche has based her life on right it's all just imagination uh, which again is kind of the ideal right um, if you go back to some of your high school studies or maybe some of your college studies with like Emerson and transcendentalism remember that the whole idea was to immerse yourself in your imagination uh, and to essentially defy the reality of your life right and you'll 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 achieve that potential if you imagine that potential right but for her at least from Stanley's perspective that's all she has to rely on and I guess a question you could ask yourself is has this idealism her imagination got her to the place where she is now has it served her for better or has it served her for worse and of course you would want to have some good uh, uh, support there uh, to answer that question Stanley likens her to the Queen of Egypt and from a from a perspective of Moses and God uh, any king or queen of Egypt would be a representation of idolatry and worshiping false idols uh, on page 159 you have Shep Hutley uh, and this is the meadow if you put these names together uh, Shep reminds you of the shepherd right and Christ is shepherd and Hutley is meadow of the hunter uh, and it kind of represents this idea of man and male dominance, right? The hunter. So the name Shep Huntley taken in totality is quite oxymoronic uh, as you have somebody like Christ who is the shepherd, who is gentle, who is compassionate, blended with or mixed with that of the hunter which is aggressive and assertive. That if I'm getting ahead of myself because we're, we're, we're inching toward the end of this lecture, that's the trap that Blanche finds herself in. How do we live in a world? How do we live in a world of paradox, a hypocritical world that at once says a man is this, but on the other hand says, but a man should be this, right? And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more toward the end. Uh, to say, to give a little bit more detail as to what I was just mentioning, when we talk about Shep Huntley, uh, Shep Huntley, um, these notions basically, you know, when you put this name together and what the name symbolize, these notions basically oppose one another. Yet this is the man, the ideal she is trying to get in touch with. This is the paradox that is not only out of reach, but can lead to complete disillusion and disarray. And on page 160, this is the trap that she is caught in. You know, it just reminds me of my mother and, and what she said to me, and I think I talked about this in a previous lecture. Um, if Christ was a high school student, uh, he, would, he would fail all of his classes, right? Because Christ is not assertive. He is not domineering. Christ does not partake in co the competitive uh, kind of drive that we find our societies, especially capitalistic societies, uh, heavily based upon, right? 
So how can we preach Christ and compassion and civility and sympathy, right? How can we preach these, pot these potential character values in a society that ultimately values dominance and male assertiveness and aggressiveness and violence and gambling and risk-taking? How in the world can we reconcile these two very different versions of a person? And I think that's the trap. That's the paradox that she just cannot figure out and it leads to the complete disarray uh, and this kind of confusion that we have here. Page 161, oh my goodness, he seduces her almost through a force of presence, yet there is a softness to it as well. But it still comes across as quite forceful, but there's a little gentleness to it too. So it's, this is where it becomes a little hard to analyze. So you gotta kinda just, you know, figure things out for yourself here. Page 162, uh, there's a reference to a tiger, which is a kind of a powerful energy, and Stanley controls it and forces it to surrender. Stanley has foreseen this. There is a victory and a triumph here for him. And this could be the aggressive god of Western religion basically uh, 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 um, controlling women uh, and a kind of independent woman as well. That being represented by the powerful energy of the tiger. Stanley must make sure that that powerful energy of Blanche is essentially stricken down and completely stifled. All right, this takes us to scene 11, last one. On page 163, Stanley's got a, a, a streak of luck uh, in this poker game. And isn't it great that right in the beginning of scene 11, they're, they're back to playing poker here. It's Stanley's way, right? Got the kid, uh, Stella's kind of, you know, where she needs to be, got everybody playing poker, and Stanley makes a comment on luck, and he says, luck is believing you're lucky. Um, it's not about luck as far as kind of fortune is concerned, that there is a shining light of fortune upon you. That's not the way Stanley looks at it. Stanley is just believing you're lucky. It's having uh, the kind of direction of mind uh, to, to just understand that you are a lucky person, or to simply state that you are lucky, therefore luck will work in your favor, right? I think that that says a lot about being a man. This is men believing they have been chosen as superior to women. It is important to stay confident in this convenient philosophy of patriarchy, right? If, if patriarchy was essentially a managed affair, right, it didn't just happen, right? Of course, you could argue that and you could have your reasons. Um, but if it was a managed affair, right, women were controlled, women were kind of designated uh, to certain uh, parts of society. And this goes for all types of society. There's so much patriarchy throughout the world, it can be a bit sickening, right? But if it's a managed system, then if you're a man who likes that sense of control and dominance, why wouldn't, why, why would you speak out against it, right? Why would you believe in anything different, right? It's important to stay confident within that philosophy. On page 164, Mitch calls him a bull. And a bull is a false idol if you look into some of the biblical uh, kind of narratives. And he calls Stanley a bull, right? So Stanley is a false idol. Page 165, even, and that, that means a lot coming from Mitch, by the way, who again is the most kind of religiously endowed, spiritually endowed character within this text. Maybe Blanche rivals him at the end here in some, in some aspects, in some respects. Uh, page 165, even Stella must somewhat lie to herself in order to press on with Stanley. Poor girl. The way she puts it to get Blanche out of the house is a way to deny the truth of Stanley. She even says that. It is apparent, if you read carefully, that Blanche has told her that Stanley slept with her. I don't think we mentioned that. Uh, at the end of scene 10, it seems like he does sleep with her. Right? He, she kind of surrenders to his will, which is on a broader, more figurative level, level women surrendering to the will of man, uh, and slept with her. And she, Blanche has told Stella about this. And now Stella is at this crucial point. She says, I can either accept what Blanche says for truth, or I can take part in kicking her out of the house and therefore deny the truth. And that's what she's decided to do, deny the truth. Page 167, when Mitch hears Blanche, his gambling hand goes limp, it gives way, right? Interesting. 
He hears Blanche, the gambling hand. Ugh, it can't gamble. But Stanley is there to gruffly encourage him. She realizes Mitch is there and is sorrowfully perplexed with all human experience. And that's from the stage direction. Very poetic. That was the question you had for your uh, discussion questions. What is the human experience that is represented here and how is it sorrowfully perplexing? I'm going to leave that up to you uh, and I know we'll get some good answers there. Page 168. Stanley wants to break the hold Blanche seems to have on Mitch almost wants to harden him or fortify him against her presence. It seems like the most important thing for Stanley is you can imagine he's at that poker table and he's just looking at Mitch and he's, and he's just thinking, what is it about Blanche that, that has your attention? Right? I want to break that attention. I want to keep you locked into gambling and risk taking and the sense of competition and violence. You stay right here in this game with me. He's, he's kind of obsessed with Mitch and keeping him at this table. Here we go, big star next to this note uh, for me. Page 169, this place is a trap. This is Blanche. It's a, and, and what we have here, I mentioned this before, so I'll just read through it, it's a paradox. On one, one hand, you have Stanley who wants to strip her of her dignity, to bring her down to the jungle with the instinctual, hopeless primate man like himself. But on the other, you have Mitch who requires her to be the same flawless idea of woman. To put that just a little bit more, let's say, starkly, Stanley will have it no other way but Blanche to kind of come down to his level, and Mitch, paradoxically, will have it no other way for Blanche to stay at some kind of pure uh, and, um, and, and respectable level. She can't just be who she is. She's caught between these two extremes, which is kind of a theme that you can apply in probably a few different ways at this point. They both expect and will not compromise with what their expectations are for a woman. And the men get to tell that story. The men get to uh, create this paradox and hold women accountable, right? The men are in control. Her delusion, her madness, her need to escape, therefore, at least in my opinion, uh, is all justified, right? She needs to get out of this house. It is a trap. It is devastating for her. And it's all justified. Uh, on page, it's very sad too. On page one, on page one sixty nine, you have Stella and Eunice debating the color of, of her dress, but Blanche assuredly corrects them and says it's Della Robia blue, uh, which basically is a reference to the Madonna and the Virgin Mary, and I think it's inferred that she's essentially transforming into this figure. She is transforming into the Virgin Mary at this point, who essentially is a matron, right? She is a matron, a mother. Uh, page 170 is Blanche's farewell, and it falls back on uh, Alan, a memory of Alan, but is this really a projection? Uh, but it seems like it's really a projection towards death. Uh, as for, which is one of the saddest parts of this last scene, is the deception that she's caught in. Oh, I'm going on a wonderful trip. Bye, everybody. It's been, it's been pleasant. Enjoy. And we really know that they've set her up and they've arranged for her to be taken to a mental asylum. So as for the deception, it is not Blanche who is guilty, but Stella. Blanche is simply living at the end here, living in some stage uh, of idealism. But I guess we could ask the question, what choice does she have, right? Um, when you think about the reality. Can we, can we criticize her for living within this delusion at the very end? Uh, during this as well, if you're thinking about, you know, what's the, what kind of sympathy, what capacity do we as readers have for the sympathy of Blanche here? Always remember that, that Stanley essentially raped her, right? Um, not, not, she surrendered to him, right? After some kind of struggle, I guess you could say. You got to keep that in mind here when you're thinking about our feelings about these characters. So maybe that generates more sympathy for us. Page 174. Again, we are deftly reminded there is no Shep Huntley. She thinks this guy Shep, this, this paradox of a man, is going to come and, and save her. But we understand, both literally and figuratively, a version of a man that can bridge the gap between a purveyor of aggressiveness and cruelty and a purveyor of gentleness and compassion. This man, this idea, this idealism does not exist. That's the reality that there is no man 
who can blend these qualities. She tries to return uh, to the apartment, the world, right? She's walking down the stairs, she tries to go back up, but Stanley blocks her return, which is essentially Stanley blocking Blanche and what she represents from returning to the world, returning to humanity, from returning to Earth. She has died and is destined for immortality, but hopefully she can do so on her own terms. Page 175, the Matron and Stanley, interestingly, these two people, uh, these are the forces that are bent on expelling her from the world. Hello, Blanche, says the Matron. She has met what she has always feared to become, old and alone and in this matron state. And now she's face to face with it. Uh, on page 176, we get some, some echoes that are going through her mind right now. And one of the questions is, uh, how do we interpret those echoes? Uh, Stanley rips off the paper lantern. This is a metaphor for her own privacy, perhaps, uh, which was achieved through pretense and deception. We, we talked about physical privacy or privacy in the last lecture, just to re, you know, repeat that idea. Another form of privacy is, let me lie to you. I'm gonna lie to everybody around me because my life is private. Let me keep that private. Maybe Maybe it validates the whole idea of lying in the first place and keeping things private. Remember, Mitch wanted this removed as well, uh, that, that paper lantern. Page 176, Stella as a, caring, uh, as a, as a carving of Eunice. Uh, earlier we talked about Stanley parroting you know, male dominance and, and kind of aspects of patriarchy. Uh, now maybe Stella is just a carving uh, or a echo uh, of, of Eunice. Momentarily, uh, Stella tries to break from Eunice's influence and protect Blanche. She tries, this last little moment here. She says, what have I done to my sister? Oh God, and she's referencing God there. She is addressing God, right? Question, do we blame Stella for what is happening to Blanche? Why or why not? Page 177. Mitch is rendered helpless against Stanley, cannot help Blanche. The matron restrains Blanche. The idea of the matron restrains the potential of her, perhaps. That's one way of looking at it. I think also it's just, it is her necessity to become the matron. It's what she's feared all along, but she feared it because of uh, her propensity for wealth and admiration of physical beauty. Now she is succumbing to and, and surrendering to what the matron is, and I think you could see this in a positive way as well. Especially when you think of the, of the Madonna, uh, uh, the mother of Christ, right? And that particular figure. Maybe this is needed from a certain religious perspective. In the end, the doctor, possibly God, possibly. The one true God, right? From a kind of um, a Hebraistic sense of things. Uh, comes to take her away. Eunice burdens Stella with a child. As she's trying to grieve for Blanche, Eunice just drops that child right into her arms and therefore, in, in many ways, incapacitates her to do anything for her sister. Oh, you got this baby. That's your life, right? So I think in some ways this is kind of a, an endless distraction of subservient motherhood which prohibits her from, ex from helping Blanche. But on the other hand, if we're thinking very positively about motherhood such as uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, such as the Madonna, uh, and maybe Maybe we have a positive notion of this endless dutifulness uh, to the child that a mother is, uh, it must give. So I think you can look at it in a couple ways here. Um, seven car stud, I think is, is mentioned uh, by the guys playing poker. Stud, it reminds you of like a horse who basically just uh, impregnates all these other horses uh, and he's got this kind of special designation, he's a special role in all of this. So maybe it's a reference to manhood and masculinity and some aspect of dominance. And I'll end uh, by just reading uh, from my book here. So the doctor does feel similar to Mitch. 
Um, also, Stella accepting the child could be, you know, and it, I guess you could say Mary accepting Christ, Mary accepting the baby Jesus. But the last notes I'll say here, the doctor is very, is like Mitch because he's got that gentleness once again. Uh, so Blanche finally surrenders at the end to, to this idea of becoming a matron. After all, Madonna was a matron and the doctor who can give her uh, the gentleness she requires. Uh, there is a muted trumpet. There is no glory uh, in the stage direction at the end. And Stella will raise a domineering brute like Stanley that takes advantage of the showmanism that reflects the God we know. That's one interpretation as well. Um, again, I could go you know, on and on and on about the end here with various interpretations, but the most important thing is that I'm putting things in place so that you can uh, try to make sense of the end and have some uh, significant uh, and uh, uh, interesting uh, things to say. Uh, thank you uh, for your time, and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you.